make them commute right so these are very natural relations and the second is the famous braid relation uh i will that will come in uh, some pictures later on so that can that is also easy to show so this braid group is isomorphic to uh the geometric braid group is isomorphic to this uh, abstract braid group with this presentation how are braids related to knots so knots are links so let me recall a definition for a link so a link is a smooth embedding of a disjoint union of finitely many circles in r3 so smoothness here i am imposing so that i have only finitely many crossings and my knots are all tame so i am not uh, really dealing with wild knots here and i can define an equivalence among uh, knots or links in three space that two are equivalent if one can be transformed into other via an ambient isotopy all right or in other words there is an orientation preserving homeomorphism of the ambient space which map the first link into the second link all these definitions are equivalent and interestingly from a geometric braid one can construct a link so for example look at this picture here so i have this uh, geometric braid on true stands uh, so it is sigma 1 sigma 1 sigma so it is sigma 1 cube and when i close it so by closing i simply mean join the nth point on the top to the nth point on the bottom okay and remember that you are in the three space so when you close it up you get a link so in this case i get the famous trefoil knot so every geometric braid gives rise to a link in the three space in fact the converse also hold and here are the landmark theorems in the subject so every link in r3 is isotopic to closure of a geometric braid is a result of uh, alexander and in fact uh, the question now is suppose i have two geometric braids and i take their closures then what is the necessary and sufficient condition on the geometric braids for the closure to be equivalent and that is given by this theorem of marco so two geometric braids let us say beta 1 and beta 2 have the same closures or isotopic closures if and only if the braids are equivalent braids that is in the group they represent the same element or they are conjugate or uh, one is obtained from the other by stabilization so you have one braid on n strand and other braid on possibly on n plus or or n minus 1 strand so one is obtained from other by appending an extra strand and one can i mean the Uh, the reverse way is very easy to check if you just write, uh, write down the diagram for beta 2 sigma n plus minus 1 and you take the closure on your notebook you can see that it will the corresponding link that you obtain is isotopic to beta 1 but the converse uh, i mean the forward implication requires an effort so in the rest of the lecture what i am going to do i am going to uh, extend these theorems to the higher genus and then to the planar setting so here is a natural question which i uh, plan to address what should be planar analog of the artin braid group remember the artin braid group has a geometric three dimensional meaning so i want to look for what should be the surface analog of this or equivalently what is the classical uh, planar analog of classical knot theory and the answer uh, stems from work of mikhail khavanov so consider this configuration of n intervals in the infinite strip r cross 0 1 again take n mark points on the top uh, line and n mark points on the bottom line with these two conditions that each strand intersect any horizontal line exactly once and no three strands have a point in common this is very important here because you may recall that in the braid setting i do not have this kind of condition and in fact i really want it that is exactly the third right dimensional move so no three strands should have a point in common so here is an example that i have drawn here so this is an example of such a configuration and we say that two such configurations are equivalent if one can be deformed into other by a homotopy of r in this infinite strip satisfying conditions 1 and 2 throughout the homotopy the usual definition all right and equivalence class of such a configuration is called a twin or a planar braid so this twin uh, term was coined by khavanov himself and also these objects appeared in the work of wawertsky and um, shabat uh, 
in the context of algebraic geometry, which I'm not really familiar, they call it cartographical groups, Grothendieck's cartographical groups. But I will refer them as twin groups. So uh, let us uh, let us take this special twin. So let as I denote this twin we are on n strands. So where i and i plus one strands are cross with each other, and then you can see that this collection of these base uh, basic twins s1 to sn minus one satisfy this condition. So look at this uh, first picture on the left hand top corner. So I have if I take if I cut it along the dotted line, uh, the three dots that I have drawn, then I have SI and then I follow composing it with SI plus one. So here I'm again placing one twin on top of the other, just I, as I do for uh, art in braids. All right. But now, since I'm allowed to have double points, I can apply this isotopy and I get the straight arcs. So SI square is one. And again, if two twins are far apart, that is IA and I, I and J are at least, uh, I mean, bigger than equal to two, difference between them is bigger than equal to two, then they of course commute by isotopy. So that is uh, in terms of this um, algebraic expression, SI SJ is SJ SI. All right. So the collection of all such twins, uh, we can make into a group, group again by placing one top one on top of the other as we do for braid groups. And Kavana showed that this Tn is in fact generated by these elementary uh, twins, S1 to Sn minus one with these defining relations. Si square is one and Si Sj equal to Sj Si. So you can see that it's a right angle coxeta group. It's a very interesting coxeta group. A lot of things is known about this. And in fact, we also recently uh, studied some properties of this group uh, showing this R infinity and uh, other uh, structural aspects. More interesting is the pure part of this. So look at the natural map from the TN into the symmetric group, just map SI to the transposition I to I plus one. And as in case of our classical braids, you have this uh, kernel and which we call the pure twin group. So a uh, let me give you a non-trivial example in this kernel. So you see that you have SI and then SI plus one. And again, I'm repeating it uh, three times. So SI, SI plus one Q, it's an, is a non-trivial example of a pure twin. So the pure twin group is in fact a, a huge group and it uh, seems difficult to understand at this point. However, some partial results are known uh, about its structure. So on three stands is fairly easy. I mean, just uh, uh, direct computation, you can show that PT3 is Z, but PT4 requires some effort and it can be shown to be isomorphic to free group of rank seven and PT5 is in fact free group of rank uh, 31. So these, all these are recent results due to Gonzalez, Leon Madina, Roque, and uh, some results of ours with the Valery Bardako and Andre Vesnin. And uh, the most recent one is due to Mostow and Roque, where they showed that the pure twin on six strands is this uh, right angle Artin group, which is free group of rank 71, free product with 20 copies of free abelian group of rank two. And uh, it seems uh, hard to uh, really find a precise description of this group for PT n where n bigger than equal to seven. We conjecture that it's a right angle Artin group. So, but right now we don't know how to really proceed with this. So now uh, you may be wondering where are the doodles? It's 11 o'clock. So you may be wondering where are the doodles? So now I have developed a planar analog of braid group, which we call twin group. And the geometric objects popped up in the work uh, of Fan and Taylor dating back to 1977, where they were studying finite collection of simple closed curves without triple or hair intersection on the two sphere. And the work was generalized by Mikhail Khamano in the same work to uh, close curve, possibly with self intersection and avoiding triple or hair intersection points. So we say that two such collections on surface are equivalent if there is a homotopy uh, in the surfaces, mapping the first collection to the second and throughout the homotopy, no triple points should be allowed. Triple or higher intersection points should be allowed. So here is an example of a doodle on, uh, you can consider it as a doodle on this two sphere. So 
you can see that all these doodles are non trivial i cannot really separate out in the first picture i cannot really separate out the three circles because triple points are not allowed similarly in the second one and in the same work kavana proved that every doodle on the two sphere is equivalent to closure of a twin so you may recall that this is an analog of classical alexander theorem and the marco theorem has also been proved recently by uh, constantin gotin who showed that two twins have equivalent closures on the two sphere if and only if they are related by certain marco moves so these marco moves are little complicated so just i want to avoid uh, writing any technical stuff here so there are certain equivalences that must be satisfied for closure to be equivalent so this is the picture of the genus zero case sphere so now let us go to hair genus case so go back to the classical knot theory first so art and braid groups have natural generalization uh, what we call virtual braid groups so basically what are virtual braid groups you take the generators and relators of the classical art and braid group and append the relation generators and relators of the symmetric group on n symbols okay so you have sigma 1 to sigma n minus 1 row 1 to row n minus 1 and sigma is are the braid generators satisfying braid relations and row i are the symmetric group generators satisfying symmetric group relations but there are some mixed relation okay the, the, they are the crucial one the mixed relation are sigma i and sigma j commute whenever they are far apart and there is this third mixed relation which looks like sort of braid relation but not quite it is as you can see sigma i and rho i are appearing in mixed fashion all these have very nice geometrical interpretation in terms of uh, 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 i mean arcs of a knot appearing through a handle so this group is called the virtual braid group and in fact it it also has a very nice geometrical interpretation so let me explain that so geometrically uh, the generators of the virtual braid group vbn can be seen as equivalent classes of following configurations in the infinite strip so you define sigma i as this kind of uh, uh, configuration of an arcs where i and i plus 1 cross and this crossing i gives uh, the information that which arc is going over and which is going under so here i am saying that from i to i plus 1 that is over and then i plus 1 to i is under one and rho i is again is crossing from i and i between i and i plus 1 strings but this is crossing i just label in with some circle this i call a virtual crossing so this virtual crossing will appear when the arcs will be passing through a handle and the the equivalence here i define as two confi such configuration are equivalent if and only if they are related by planar isotropies and uh, the equivalence generated by following moves so first one is the uh, classical rademacher 2 move if you know what are the rademacher moves basically this is exactly the rademacher move 2 uh, move and third is the rademacher 3 move so basically if you have two arcs and the third arc passing them you can move it from top to bottom that is what this second picture is and then in the virtual moves again you have the two moves and then there is, this is exactly the mixed move so you can see that if this circled one is rho i and this one is rho i plus 1 and this is si i am saying that this is same as si plus 1 rho i rho i plus 1 and as you can see this is exactly the relation here so this is all about the virtual uh, braid groups and virtual braid groups play the role of groups for virtual knot theory so what are virtual knots so there are uh, surprisingly this virtual knots actually appear purely combinatorially in the work of luke ofman in 1999 and uh, basically it appeared on uh, so every knot you can associate what he called a gauss diagram and the kopman asked which gauss diagram can be can every gauss diagram be realized by a classical knot and he found that there are plenty of gauss diagrams which do not really relate to classical knots and that is what gave birth to what is now known as virtual knot theory so uh, in luke ofman's uh, uh, language virtual knots are simply equivalence classes of four valent planar graphs where each vertex is either a classical crossing that is i have the over and under information 
and the or is a virtual crossing where i don't i just simply put a circle or i just uh, don't give the over and under information together with uh, equivalence uh, generated by the following moves so as you can see these moves are exactly uh, if you uh, remove the first one because the first one is the kink and remember that in the configuration i want arcs to be monotone so therefore kink uh, relation doesn't appear when you are talking about groups and the first set of moves is the classical moves the second set of moves is the virtual moves and third is the mixed move you can maybe relate to the previous picture you can see the exactly the same but there is one more the first one here kink all right this is what called virtual knots and again one can define closure of a virtual knot so you have four valent graph on the plane define the closure exactly in the same fashion join the top nth point to the bottom nth point all right and uh, surprisingly it doesn't really depend which way you join although you are joining on the plane there is no three space here but the third right uh, the mix move really help you pass this arc from left to the right therefore this closure operation is very well defined and closure of therefore closure of every virtual braid gives rise to what is called virtual knot in the sense of loop kopman and as we expect for a good theory alexander and marco theorem are also known in this setting so i think they are due to uh, kamada saichi kamada lu kopman himself and possibly other people different proofs so i will not state them here due to lack of time now let me now give you connection where they relate to surfaces uh of higher genus thickened surfaces so virtual knots can actually be thought of as stable equivalence classes of knots in thickened surfaces so how that happens so suppose f1 d1 and f2 d2 are two pairs uh, where fi is a compact oriented surface and d is a link diagram on f so by a link diagram i mean a classical link diagram you draw a classical link diagram on the surface i say they are equivalent if there is a third compact oriented surface with orientation preserving embeddings of f1 and in f3 and f2 in f3 says that f1 d1 and f2 d2 are related by classical rademacher moves on the third surface okay and we say that two such configurations are stably equivalent if there is a finite sequence of uh, such equivalences relating first to the other so let me explain you by an example look at this so consider the torus on the torus you draw this uh, knot which is basically a knot and on the other hand you take the meridian a knot so as if you look directly they do not appear to be uh, isotropic equivalent to each other but in the stable sense they are equivalent because you can see that first torus you can embed inside this torus with a long handle and the second one this is stably equivalent to this cylinder uh, with this meridian and here they are equivalent because you can deform this one here and similarly here all right so therefore uh, these two uh, knots in the tori are stably equivalent as virtual knots so it's a theorem of carter uh, scott carter sachi kamada and masaki saito and also independently proved by kupperberg in 2003 uh, that virtual links as defined by luke opman as four valent graphs on the plane are equivalent to stable equivalence classes of links in thickened surfaces so now again uh, analog question for virtual in the virtual setting what should be the planar analog of virtual braid groups are equivalent virtual knot theory so this is uh, our work with neha nanda so you consider configurations of any interval in the infinite strip again with n mark point on the top and on the bottom so that each strand intersect each horizontal line exactly once no triple points are allowed and exact each crossing is either a real or a virtual crossing so remember that in this case you don't really have this idea of over and under because we are talking about surface knots here but we one kind of one type of crossing we don't really uh, do anything and the other one we just mark a circle or some other distinction uh, from the real crossing and we say two such configurations are equivalent if one can be deformed into other by planar isotopies and following moves so you see the first move also appeared in the twin case this is the virtual analog and then this uh, this is also the virtual one and this is the mixed one theory goes quite parallel but the groups are entirely different 
And an equivalence class of such configurations is called a virtual twin or a virtual planar braid. And geometrically, if I set SI as these generators and rho as these generators, one can easily see that by definition, they satisfy this relation as you can see from the picture, because you are allowed to have double point for real double crossing and their far commutativity hold, virtual double crossing allowed, far commutativity hold, virtual triple points are allowed. So therefore you have this kind of uh, uh, third right master move for virtual one, and this is a mixed one. And uh, we recently showed that this, this is not really difficult. So the set of virtual twins on n strands form a group. And in fact, it is isomorphic to the group with this set of generators and relations. So you have n minus one generators SI, the rho i's, where SI satisfy the twin relations, rho i satisfy the symmetric group relations, and then there are mixed relations. This is what we call the virtual twin group. And in fact, this virtual twin group form the group for virtual doodles on, that is the equal, um, uh, doodles on surfaces of higher genus. So this, uh, uh, thanks to work of uh, Bartholomew and Kamada and Kamada in 2018, where they had already developed this theory. So we only developed the group theory part. So a virtual doodle diagram is an immersion of design union of circles on the plane R2 with finitely many real crossings or virtual crossings, so that there are no triple or higher real intersection points. Again, you denote the real and cross, virtual crossing exactly in the same way as we define in the group setup. Here is an example of a virtual doodle. And we say they are, they are equivalent if the equivalence is generated by isotopies of the plane or the classical and virtual moves together with these kind of mixed moves. So the moves, you can see that if you remove the top one, this kink one, the real classical kink and the virtual kink, then the moves are exactly the what we have defined for virtual, uh, virtual uh, twin uh, group, all right? An equivalence class of this is called a virtual doodle. And also, it's a in the same work, uh, Bartholomew, Fenn, Kamada, and Kamada, they show that there is a bijection between the set of virtual doodle diagrams on the plane and the set of stable equivalence classes of doodles on surfaces. So this is, therefore, virtual doodles are the higher genus case. And this, therefore, extend the work of Khovanov, where he consider only the sphere case. And I will end with this result, recent result with uh, my student Neha, uh, that every virtual doodle on the plane is equivalent closure of a virtual twin diagram. So this is analog of the Alexander theorem. And two virtual twin diagrams on the plane have equivalent closure if and only they are related by certain sequence of Markov moves, which I have not written here. This is analog of the classical Alexander theorem. So I will stop here. Thank you. Let us uh, thank Mahinder Singh for his excellent talk. Um, we have time for just one quick question. If anybody has a question. Looks like there are no questions. Uh, just I'm curious, uh, where did you find this picture in the thank you screen? It's a very nice one. Yeah, I think this is in, uh, I found it in, uh, on the web, of course, but so this is in some temple in Rajasthan. Oh, wonderful. We should find out where this temple is. <laughs> it's really nice. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. So not, yeah, not do appear in Indian culture, I mean, ancient times. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, one maybe uh, uh, more mathematical type of question, just a very general one. Uh, relations among these uh, virtual braid group, virtual twin group and all those things, they have been studied. I mean, like this uh, virtual pure group and this, um, yeah, yeah. No, so, sorry, PTN and then at, a, at the end you had some VTN, uh, they have been studied, so, have been understood. Yeah, so actually uh, maybe some parts I can answer. So group theoretically, I mean, uh, the structural properties of virtual twin groups, uh, we recently uh, did uh, work with our student and a postdoc. Hmm. And in the virtual, virtual pure twin group turns out to be an irreducible right angle R10 group. Okay. And also we uh, showed about its R infinity and other properties, hmm. which also confirms the recent conjecture of uh, Carol Decampe about our infinity property of right angle art in groups and so on. Okay. 
yeah but uh, and and interestingly analogous to classical braid groups these twin groups are also have the configuration space models aha uh -huh. so okay. they can also like for, for example the twin group can be thought of as complement of triple diagonals in the n dimensional euclidean space okay so from that perspective people have studied them the homotopy aspect okay so we are still wondering whether this virtual analogs have similar interpretation interpretation yes very nice okay thank you again for your wonderful talk thank you uh so we move on to the next talk uh, in the symposium um the next okay. speaker is vimala ramani uh, she is from she is a faculty member at anna university uh she did her phd at chennai mathematical institute in fact under my guidance <laughs> uh she had the title of her talk is zero divisor coupling of real oriented grassman manifolds so uh, thank you thank you parmesh yeah uh, so but... now vimala you should share your screen okay yeah Okay. okay first i would like to thank the organizers in particular professor prashik kumar uh, for giving me this opportunity and also conducting this wonderful conference i also thank professor shankaran uh, for the encouragement and giving me an opportunity in this symposium okay the i will talk on the zero divisor coupling of real oriented grassman manifolds uh, professor mahender Uh, talk about geometry okay his talk was completely geometric mine is going to be completely algebraic there will not be any single figure i am sorry about that uh, okay so this is the outline of the talk uh, first is the introduction then we will see some results in algebra next we will see some connection of this algebraic results to topology after this we consider the space of real oriented grassman manifolds Uh, for them we we do something that uh, compute the rational zero divisor coupling and things like that finally we will see the recent developments uh, in this area so we start with a vibration uh, p from e to b is a vibration uh, the schwarz genus of this vibration is a minimum number k such that uh, we can cover the base b with open sets u not u1 u to uk such that each ui admits a continuous local section of the vibration so next we consider a path connected space x to this path connected space x we can consider two vibrations first one is the path vibration uh, consider px the space of all free paths in x uh, the map phi from px to x cross x is sends a path in gamma to its end points gamma of 0 comma gamma of 1 is a vibration the schwarz genus of this vibration is called the topological complexity of x next uh, the, consider any base point x not in x uh, consider p0 of x it is the space of all paths in x which start at x0 now the map from p0 of x to x0 cross x extends a path starting at x0 to x0 comma uh, this end of the end point is a safe vibration the schwarz genus of this vibration is called the lushnerik schnirelmann category of x if we observe this vibration psi from p0 of x to x0 cross x is a pullback bundle or pullback uh, bundle of the path vibration through the inclusion map from x0 cross x to x cross x uh, so psi can be considered as a subbundle of the path vibration eta therefore the schwarz genus of psi is less than or equal to the schwarz genus of eta this will tell uh, the category of x or the listener 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 generalman category of x is less than or equal to the topological complexity of x in general it is difficult to compute uh, the category of x or the topological complexity of x we try to find a cohomological lower bound for this invariance uh, for topological complexity Uh, the zero divisor coupling is a cohomological lower bound 
so for the space of, of uh, real oriented Grassmann manifolds, uh, we compute the rational zero divisor coupling. When k equal to three, we also compute the Z2 zero divisor couplings in some cases, and we compare both the zero divisor couplings. So now we will see uh, the results in algebra. Uh, for us, A is a graded commutative K algebra, where K is a field with characteristic either zero or a prime P, which is greater than 2D. Here, D is the top dimensional uh, K vector space of A. We can define the couplings of A as the length of the non longest non-vanishing product in A positive. When A is a graded commutative algebra, A tensor A becomes a graded commutative algebra over K under the multiplication uh, defined by A tensor B dot C tensor D is minus one power degree of B to degree of C times AC tensor BD. Now consider the map mu K from A tensor A to A, uh, which is defined by A tensor B is mapped down to AB. This map is in fact a K-algebra homomorphism from A tensor A to A. The kernel of this map is called the ideal of zero devices. So each element in the kernel is called a zero divisor. And the couplings of this uh, kernel, kernel of mu k is called the k zero divisor couplings of E. So how to get uh, zero devices? We start with any x non-zero in A positive. Consider the element one tensor x minus x tensor one in A tensor A. Then mu k of u will be zero. So this is a zero divisor. So in fact, the ideal of non-zero device is the ideal of zero devices is generated by the set of all elements of the form one tensor x minus x tensor one, where x is in A. Uh, this is due to Cohen. Now we see that if we start with an element uh, x in A positive, we can get hold of a non-zero zero devices. So we are thinking, okay, suppose we start with the longest non-vanishing product in A, which gives the coupling. Uh, can we get um, I mean, kind of uh, longest non-vanishing product of non-zero uh, device means zero devices. So uh, suppose x1 power a1, x2 power a2, et cetera, xm power am is the longest non-vanishing product in a positive. Uh, then if, suppose you take ui to be one tensor xi minus xi tensor one. Consider the product uh, u1 power a1, u2 power a2, et cetera, um power a1. Uh, this is a non-zero zero divisor. So therefore, the zero divisor couplings of A will be greater than or equal to sigma AI. But sigma AI is the coupling of A. Therefore, uh, what we get is coupling of A is a lower bound for zero divisor couplings of A. So our aim is to get a better lower bound for the zero divisor couplings of A starting from the couplings of A. So we take an element is uh, non-zero in A positive. So the height of X is the largest uh, positive integer such that X power K is non-zero. So in the first lemma, uh, we are trying to get uh, the height of a zero divisor uh, of the form one tensor X minus X tensor one from the height of X. So suppose X is an element in A power R where R is greater than zero as an equality. That means X is in A positive with height of x to be k, then what is the height of the corresponding zero divisor u, which is one tensor x minus x tensor one. If r is r, then uh, height of x is one, height of u is also one. If r is even, then the height of u is two power k, sorry, two k, so two times the height of x, uh, because u, u power two k is minus one power k, two uh, k choose k times x power k tensor x power k because we have assumed uh, the characteristic of the field is either zero or a prime p greater than 2d so we have u power 2k is non-zero and because the height of x is k the next power of u is u power 2k plus one is going to be zero okay. in the next lemma we assume or is the smallest integer uh, which is greater than zero and less than or equal to such that ar is non-zero that is the first uh, dimension in which a is non-zero. 
suppose there is an element x in a power r such that r times height of x is d this means suppose height of x is k we will get x power k belongs to ad and by the choice of r uh, this will be the longest non vanishing product therefore the cup length of a is height of x or k is height of x or d by r now uh, assume cup length of a is k suppose the longest non vanishing product in a which gives the cup length is x1 power a1 x2 power a2 etc x m power am so first consider those x i s which are of odd degree say the first l of them x1 x2 xl or of odd degree that means a1 a2 al or all one then after that a i s can be greater than 1 so all the other x i s have degree even so now look at a corresponding zero divisor so corresponding to x i define the zero divisor as u i equal to 1 times x i minus x i times r1 then we have u1 u2 etc ul times ul plus 1 two times uh, a, al plus 1 etc um power 2 power 2 times am will be a non zero zero divisor so this tells us that the zero divisor cup length of a will be greater than or equal to 2k minus l or two times cup length of a minus l so further if we assume r and x are in part 1 like that Uh, naturally because if r is strictly less than d then it has to be even uh, therefore uh, if you consider okay height of x uh, height of x is k then height of u will be 2k but uh, u power 2k is already in uh, ad tensor ad the top dimensional vector space of a tensor a therefore uh, zero divisor cup length of a will be given by this element u power 2k so which is two times cup length of a or two times height of x next we consider r to be a of y where uh, y square is an element in a so this in fact uh, this structure of r is motivated by the structure of the rational cohomology algebra of uh, oriented grassmann manifold so if r is like this then the cup length of r is cup length of a plus 1 because uh, we are, we can only okay multiply the longest non vanishing product in a by y so the next one suppose degree of y is odd then the zero divisor cup length of r is zero divisor cup length of a plus 1 because degree of y is odd then the corresponding zero divisor will have height 1 and if degree of r which is y is even if degree of y is even uh, then the corresponding zero divisor okay will have height greater than or equal to 2 so uh, we will get the zero divisor cup length of r is greater than or equal to zero divisor cup length of a plus 2 so these are the algebraic results we have got and using this uh, we will find the rational zero divisor cup length of the grassmann manifold so what is the connection of these algebraic results to topology so let us assume x is a compact path connected space and a to be the cohomology algebra of x with coefficients in a field then the cup length of this cohomology algebra is called the k cup length of x and the zero divisor cup length of uh, this cohomology algebra is called the k zero divisor cup length of x now consider this uh, k algebra homomorphism it is like mu k cup k from h star x k tensor h star x comma k2 h star x k uh, this one is in fact the map induced in the cohomology by the diagonal embedding of x into x cross x okay uh, now for uh, polyhedron okay we can even assume x is a polyhedron so path connected space uh, the topological complexity of x uh, uh, the zero divisor cup length of x in with respect to any field k as the lower bound and the uh, upper bound is given by the dimension connectivity relation 
it is uh, topological complexity of x is less than two times dimension of x by r plus one. So we assume r is a connected means of or connected polyhedron. Now we consider the space of uh, real oriented Grassmann manifolds. Okay, so this is the space of all oriented k planes in R n. The dimension of this oriented Grassmann manifold is k times n minus k. When k is one, uh, g tilde n one is the sphere s n minus one, and we know the topological complexity of spheres. For m e one, uh, it is uh, two, and m is odd, it is going to be one. And k is two. G delta n is a closed, simply connected, symplectic manifold. Therefore, the topological complexity equals its dimension. Also, so we assume k is greater than or equal to three. Also, g delta n k is homeomorphic to g delta n n minus k. Therefore, we assume k is less than or equal to the integral part of n by two. And uh, even for k greater than or equal to two, these manifolds g delta n k are One connected that is pi one is zero and pi two is non-zero. Uh, using this uh, dimension connectivity relation, we have this inequality or bounds for the topological complexity of the Grassmann manifolds. Means oriented Grassmann manifolds. Uh, the lower bound is given by the zero divisor coupling of X with respect to any field K, and the upper bound is the dimension of X. So we will see a description of the rational cohomology algebra of uh, real-oriented Grassmann manifolds. So the canonical k-plane bundle uh, over g tilde n k is denoted by gamma tilde n k, and the canonical n minus k bundle is perpendicular to gamma tilde n k is gamma tilde n k perpendicular to so n minus k-plane bundle. Uh, Let like Pi denote the ith rational Pontryagin class of gamma tilde n k. Where i varies from one to the integral part of k by two, and for the bundle gamma delta n k perpendicular, uh, let p i bar denote the i Pontryagin rational Pontryagin class, uh, where i varies from one to integral part of n minus k by two. Uh, since gamma delta n k direct sum gamma delta n k perpendicular is the trivial Rankine bundle, uh, we have uh, the Pontry total Pontryagin class. Rational Pontryagin class of gamma tilde n k times uh, the uh, total rational Pontryagin class of gamma tilde n k perpendicular is one. Um, let us take S to be the integral part of k by two, and T to be the integral part of n minus k by two. When k is even, one has the rational Euler class E k or E, okay, in H k of g tilde n k uh, q. Similarly, when n minus k or uh, 2t is even, we have the corresponding Euler class in e n minus k in h n minus k g tilde n k q. So here, this Euler class e k square will be uh, the Pontryagin class p k by 2, which is p s. And similarly, if uh, n minus k is even, then we have this uh, e n minus k square is uh, integral with the Pontryagin class. Uh, p bar uh, integral part of n minus k by 2. In k is odd, of course, uh, e k is zero, and similarly, if n minus k is odd, e n minus k is zero. Also, we have this uh, relation uh, between these Euler classes. Uh, e n minus e k times e n minus k is zero. Further, when n is even k is odd, there's a cohomology class sigma in h n minus one of the delta in k q, which sigma square is Zero. So, with these notations, we will describe the cohomology algebra with rational of uh, oriented Grassmann manifolds uh, with rational coefficients. Uh, let us denote the algebra or subalgebra just generated by these Pontryagin classes by the symbol H S plus T T. Also, uh, we should realize that the height of P one is S T, and this. P1 for ST generates the top dimensional cube vector space H S plus T uh, for ST in dimension for ST. So with these uh, notations, so this is the description of the cohomology algebra. When both n and k are even, the first one says it is H S plus T S with e to S uh, e to T, where e to S square is P S and e to D square is P bar T. 
with e to s and e to t is zero. And when okay, k is even and n is odd, it is uh, h s plus t s uh, with e to s, where e to s square is p s. And when n is even and k is odd, it is uh, h isomorphic. It is h s plus t s joined in sigma, where sigma square is zero. So uh, if you look at the uh, section two and three in particular. Uh, it is like okay, we can take a to be the algebra uh, H S plus T S and uh, y to be e to s or sigma. So and r to be the cohomology ring of the uh, rational I means uh, cohomology ring of uh, oriented Grassmann manifolds. So we can use the algebraic result we have got, and we compute uh, zero divide set coupling of okay, the rational cohomology of oriented Grassmann manifolds. So this is uh, the picture. So in each case, we can see what is the cup length and what is the cohomology class that gives the cup length or the zero divisor cup length and the corresponding zero divisor. Okay, that gives the zero divisor cup length. So just uh, one observation. Suppose k is three. In this case. The zero divisor rational zero divisor cup length of g delta n three is n minus three when n is even and when n is odd it is n minus one. Okay, now uh, it's just the standard result. Uh, this zero divisor cup length gives a uh, wire bound for the topological complexity. So that's what we have got. Uh, okay, so we saw that uh, for any field k, the zero divisor cup length. Of uh, the zero divisor cup length of uh, x is going to be a lower bound for the topological complexity. So we have computed the rational zero divisor cup length for the oriented uh, Grassmann manifolds, and we have computed in terms explicitly in terms of n and k. So we thought, okay, uh, let us try what is the z2 uh, zero divisor cup length of the oriented Grassmann manifolds. Okay, but uh, the C2 cohomology ring of oriented Grassmann manifolds itself is not known in general. Uh, but recently work has been done in this direction. Uh, the, so what we do is we look at the covering projection, universal covering projection P from G delta and K to G and K. We know the Z2 cohomology of G and K very well, right? So using that, we try to get some information uh, about this z uh, 2 cohomology algebra oriented Grassmann manifolds. So we look at the, suppose gamma in K is the canonical K plane bundle over the unoriented Grassmann manifold G and K. And gamma tilde in K is the canonical uh, oriented K plane bundle over the oriented Grassmann manifold G tilde in K. Uh, we can see that this uh, gamma tilde in K is nothing but the pullback bundle of gamma in K by P. K it is P star of uh, gamma, gamma tilde in K is P star of gamma in K. So if we take Wi to be the Stiefel-Wittnick class of gamma in K over G in K, then the Stiefel-Wittnick class of the oriented K plane bundle, gamma tilde in K it is denoted by Wi tilde, it is nothing but P star of Wi. Also, uh, G tilde in K is uh, simply connected so pullback of W1 will be zero. The first uh, Stiefel-Wittig class is going to be zero. So the uh, P star of H star G and K is going to be generated by only by W2 tilde, uh, W3 tilde up to WK tilde. All, this has a special property, namely it's uh, self-annihilating subalgebra of uh, H star G tilde and K of the dimension. Uh, what do you mean by self-annihilating subalgebra? So what do you mean by self-annihilating subalgebra? Suppose X is a cohomology class in terms of this uh, stiefel wittnick classes and another, Y is another uh, cohomology class in terms of this uh, stiefel wittnick classes. Suppose their product is in the top dimensional cohomology of G delta NK, then that has to be zero. So this also uh, forces that there are cohomology classes in H star of G tilde and K, uh, which cannot be expressed as polynomials in stiefel wittnick classes. Uh, they are called the anomalous classes. So 
So first, these uh, were studied by uh, Gorbash and Rusin uh, in that paper uh, on a note on the cohomology of oriented Grassmann manifolds. They have uh, completely calculated the cohomology ring for g delta n2 for n greater than or equal to 2. And in the case of k equal to 3, uh, they have considered the cases n varying from 6 to 11 and given they have given the additive generators. Uh, they are not able to find I mean, the ring structure is not known till now. So what we have done is we took those examples and for those example cases uh, computed the zero device subcoupling. So this is the result uh, for n equal to six, okay, the zero device subcoupling is three and n equal to seven, eight, nine, the zero device subcoupling is eight. For 10, it is nine and 11, it is 10. Actually, these are the, uh, okay, so zero devices, which gives this zero device coupling as well. So here we, U denotes the zero device corresponding to the second stiffle weighting class, W2 delta. V is the zero device corresponding to the third stiffle weighting class, W2 delta. And, and AI denotes an anomalous class in the dimension I. So it is in HI, delta I, three. And AI bar is the corresponding zero device. So that's what we have done. And apart from this, for certain, okay, so from this observe, this one observation, uh, for these cases, n equal to 6 to 11, uh, if we compare the zero, Z to zero divisor coupling with the rational zero divisor coupling, we see that uh, for uh, 6 and 9 and 11, they are equal. And uh, this 7, 8, Sorry, seven, eight, ten. In fact, this uh, this is z uh, two zero device coupling is strictly greater than the ratio of zero device coupling. In fact, for certain infinite families of oriented Grassmann manifolds, also we could prove this inequality. Uh, for this, we didn't compute the z two zero device coupling, but then we got a lower bound uh, to be two power t. So um, this proves. Uh, this uh, rational zero device coupling of g delta n3, particularly when k equal to 3, this works. Uh, this is uh, okay, this is less than or equal to the z to zero device coupling. The rational zero device coupling is less than or equal to z to zero device coupling. In fact, for all the cases we have tested, uh, this seems to be true, but still we don't have a general proof for this. So uh, now we will see some uh, recent results. So this is not for oriented Grassmann manifold, uh, but for real unoriented Grassmann manifold. So a very recent result thing in November and or so this has been uploaded in the archive. So Peter Pavashik, uh, he has found the zero device coupling and bounds for topologic complexity of real unoriented Grassmann manifold. So he has done, so he's computed the uh, zero device coupling for case K equal to three and uh, four. Okay, so I have just stated the result for three. So for his, for him, for, for corresponding to a cohomology class X, the zero device coupling is denoted by Z of X. And for any integer n greater than or equal to zero, uh, this rho of n is the minimal integral power of two that is strictly bigger than n. So this is the result uh, he has uh, obtained for that is the zero device coupling for G N three or G three N, and it gives the corresponding zero divisor also, which gives this zero divisor. I think these are the references. So I I have not given all the references. So I will end the talk. Are there any questions? So if there is any question, we will just take one question. Hmm? So, uh, may I ask something? Yes. Yes. So, ma'am, there is uh, an equivalent version of uh, topological complexity as well. I mean, incorporating some group action. So, since Grassmann ah. admit nice actions, I mean, oh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's G topological complexity. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. It's not. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, yeah. We have not studied that part. I see. I see. Okay. No. Okay, uh, 
I, I wish there was more time to ask for more questions, but uh, since we are out of time, uh, it's time to thank the speaker. Uh, thanks, Vimala, for a nice talk. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Let us go to the next talk in this session. Um, our next speaker is uh, Professor uh, Ramesh Kasilingam. He did his, he is at uh, IIT Madras. Uh, he did his PhD at uh, IIT Bombay. Uh, so I have also known him for a long time since he was actually a graduate student. So, and his uh, title of the talk is Smooth Structures on uh, Complex Projective Space of Dimension Between 5 and 8. Uh, Ramesh. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much uh, for giving opportunity to share some of the idea uh, in this uh, EMS conference. So can and you, also, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, can you please upload your uh, slide and maybe Vimala should uh, okay. do that. Uh, maybe she has yes. to leave uh, from slide. Uh, yes, madam, uh, you please uh, uh, close your screen, madam, so that uh, Professor Ramesh can uh, share the screen. Yeah, maybe, is it possible for you to do it yourself, sir? Ah, okay. Yes, yes sir, I, I'm, I'm doing it. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Uh, is it visible? Yes, yes, yes. Please go on. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, the thank you very much, uh, sir, uh, Professor Sangran, sir, uh, for uh, giving me opportunity to share some of the idea in this conference. And I'm very happy to uh, appear here. And uh, my title of the talk is Smooth Structure on CPM. And uh, in uh, 528, uh, that is recently I submitted. But uh, CP4, already another paper I have submitted that is published. So that I, I, I'm combining uh, all those dimensions from here. And uh, this is uh, some of the... Uh, uh, fundamental problem in geometry and topology. So, <clears throat> so here let me start with uh, uh, idea from uh, the foundation of the geometry topology, namely the study of exotic structures. Maybe in, in between you can understand all the word. So that is a, a fundamental interest in geometry topology. So usually uh, these are the uh, some extra structure on uh, on your topological manifold so that uh, we can start understanding uh, and each structure separately for applying calculus. So how many calculus, a different kind of calculus one can able to do on, on the underlying topological manifold so that uh, it's uh, nice to understand each structure separately. Uh, not only understand each structure, we can put a geometry structures also on each exotic structure so that how the behavior of the geometry structure will change uh, if you change the differentiable structure. So that is that are the fundamental uh, idea one can able to start understand. And uh, along these questions, the first result came with uh, Milner. Uh, namely, uh, there are uh, manifold, smooth manifold homeomorphic to a seven but not diffeomorphic. So that result is uh, reflecting uh, in this area so that uh, there are many development, the new modern uh, topology uh, developed, namely differential topology as well as differential geometry. Uh, so uh, after that, after that, people started looking at in a different kind of category, namely piecewise linear manif uh, piecewise category and smooth category, separate separately started understanding and working on it. And uh, still, even though still, uh, simplest object also, we don't have such a kind of answer for uh, fundamental questions. So that now we are we are really like to look at those uh, uh, simplest object uh, uh, for understanding uh, exotic structure as well as geometric structure. So that's a point of view now modern mathematics started. So here uh, on S7, later on with the care wire so, uh, in 63, so exactly 28 uh, inequivalent, inequivalent smooth stretches possible on size seven. So that is really again, again reflecting uh, uh, the idea how, how the, the surgery theory 
can be can be able to develop to, to look at the arbitrary manifolds so the, these are the idea is really helpful to look at arbitrary manifolds how we can uh, try to find and understand the exotic structure and uh, how uh, if it is exotic structure possible then how many of them and uh, what is the relation between each to each two structures is there any kind of uh, uh, geometric relations between them so those kind of uh, uh, natural question one can carry it out so the this uh, this is the just uh, uh, impression uh, point of view to uh, look at more general manifolds and before uh, going to the general manifold i just want to introduce modern terminology namely homotopy spheres so homotopy spheres means uh, is a closed oriented smooth manifold is a homotopy equivalent to sm standard m spheres but due to poincare conjecture that is true for all dimension therefore in fact homotopy equivalent implies homeomorphism homeomorphic to sm so now collect all those uh, collections and put a uh, equivalence relation namely diffeomorphism orientation diffeomorphisms and uh, that orientation diffeomorphism classes i will denote theta m and within the theta m uh, a manifold called exotic sphere means it is just not diffeomorphic to standard sphere it is a homeomorphic to standard sphere the topology same but the differentiable structures are different so such a uh, homotopy sphere is called exotic spheres so these are the modern terminology one can use frequently so that it will be convenient to talk about talk about here theta m is precisely the diffeomorphism oriented oriented diffeomorphism classes but actually milner kerweyer worked instead of oriented diffeomorphism classes they have worked the hatch cooperatism classes of the homotopy spheres but later on the uh, the celebrated result name namely hatch cooperatism theorem due to s uh, due to smale then one can able to uh, see that this set this oriented diffeomorphism classes this set can be identified with the hatch cooperatism class of the homotopy spheres for higher dimensional so that uh, we can uh, frequently uh, use this identification wherever convenient one can able to use it so then uh, this uh, people can started looking at uh, uh, this group understanding uh, this set the how we can put a group structure or is there any other structure one can able to build up then kerweyer milner uh, proved that in fact each theta m is a finite abelian group except the four dimensional under the operation connected sum operation but uh, that uh, dimension 3 is due to berelman so is a poincare with three dimensional poincare conjecture therefore uh, uh, one can able to uh, understand the group structures by using the group structure how to relate the geometric structure namely exotic structures so by what are the possibility to compare with the group structures with the exotic structures uh, somewhat uh, the behavior of the exotic structure how it vary depends on the group structures for example in the s7 there are uh, 28 namely the, 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 this is z28 okay 28 uh, uh, groups uh, group 28 in equivalent smooth structures the group structures namely is at 28 is at modulo 28 so there are then again started looking at what about in the higher dimension bigger than 7 so started uh, understanding that that's where the surgery theory started and uh, it is purely uh, related to uh, algebraic topology namely that converted that those problems in, into algebraic topology namely homotopy stable homotopy theory then by using stable homotopy theory computations and you know, how we can able to compute this group that is the idea but the, the algebraic topology is uh, the stable homotopy theory uh, influences the many 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 uh, good idea is a come up uh, again and again but the same kind of idea one can able to look at for arbitrary manifolds also so that is a point of uh, development of the stable homotopy theory so here uh, i will just recall for convenience what is the minimum connected sum so that it will be easy look at so i take a two any uh, need not be smooth oriented but oriented orientation is necessary okay but uh, unoriented manifold also one can able to define but at least one of the manifold should be oriented so that the connected sum operation is well defined but both non oriented manifold uh, the higher dimension like uh, greater than uh, greater than or equal to 3 uh, if both are non oriented manifolds then it's very difficult to give a uh, well defined operations so that uh, we can assume orientation is uh, is is here necessary so the connected sum means uh, you just take uh, two uh, manifold m1 m2 oriented manifold you just remove uh, closed disk the corresponding dimensions disk then you can patch it along the boundary okay that patching along the boundary is a via orientation preserving diffeomorphism from 
uh, if it is n n di m dim m dimensional manifold then the boundary is sm minus 1 so sm minus 2 sm minus 1 they take a orientation diffeomorphisms then you can patch it so such a way one can informally one can able to understand the connections but this operation itself is a very very much interesting separately so i don't want to put in the in this talk separately because it's a very uh, uh, technique technically i have to understand this uh, uh, definitions there are more more technical technical due to for example serif result disk uh, isotopy theorem is really uh, involving for well define of this operation so it's a, it's not a, a trivial kind of thing it's a non trivial uh, fact to uh, prove the well defined for this operations so really fa our famous serif result we have to use this isotopic theorem really interested here but here for observing so i can able to uh, uh, understand the, by patching via yeah, we can understand so these are the connected sums of these two manifold means you can patch along the boundary and this is well defined as i said the way up, this is a well defined up to orientation preserving if you are not not uh, just to give you more reason just orientation is a very very important here because we have to use the disk theorem okay and under this operations uh, uh, not only uh, uh, any two arbitrary manifold then uh, this collections of all arbitrary such a collections of uh, manifold oriented diffeomorphism classes of such a arbitrary manifolds under this operation is just a monoid as in fact is a uh, is a commutative monoid but we cannot able to put a Uh, uh group structures namely what about invertible element for this operation is a very critical point here okay for more general collections of manifolds it's not possible to uh, justify whether this operations for me uh, under this operation for me group structure but theta m is just a particular sub collections of these arbitrary collections namely only homotopy spheres all those uh, diffeomorphism classes of the standard spheres only those uh, collections of manifold we are taking and that, that collections is a admitted group structure okay arbitrary collection may not be admitted group structure but only the uh, sub collection namely diffeomorphism classes of the manifolds uh, they are so, i mean the manifold uh, homo homeomorphic smooth manifold homeomorphic to the standard sphere sm okay and uh, this, this under this group group operations the uh, milner and kerr were started understanding and they have computed uh, this group structures the dimension less than 19 okay that is a uh, with the kerr wire papers uh, rep uh, giving representations and here the four dimensional except the four dimensional up to dimension 6 so one dimensional two dimensional it is here just uh, our classification theorems and three dimensional due to mois so every three dimensional manifold admit a unix smooth structures not only spheres And, uh, any arbitrary manifold admitted a smooth structure unique smooth structure but uh, here four dimensional still exceptional so still the work uh, that uh, there is a smooth point curve conjecture uh, still unknown problems the after 5 and 6 then somewhat understood and less than i, I mean up to 18 uh, we one can able to write it immediately the after 18 that is also possible but it is related to stable homotopy group of spheres okay so uh, i don't want to bring uh, all those uh, technical stuff here just i want to make it uh, the content on which what are the uh, my work related and uh, but i want to i would like to uh, share some of the recent idea along this direction due to this uh, milner in the, uh, in 2011 uh, he published some survey article in that article he, he stated that and only these dimensions 1 2 3 5 6 12 12 and 61 possibly n equal to 4 on the corresponding standard sphere has a unique smooth structure but the, that that observation is due to koshman and uh, uh, mahowald that is a this uh, that is related to stable homotopy spheres computation okay in particular uh, two primary component of the stable homotopy group of spheres the corresponding spheres by observing that computations then milner stated that the, this is these are the on these dimensions have a unique smooth structure but later on as uh, 61 dimension has a unique smooth structure recently in the 2017 the wang and zu so they have proved that it, it, it has a unique smooth structure on the 61 and uh, not only that there are many many consequences interested uh, that they, they have mentioned in their paper so namely here the only all dimensional spheres namely s1 s3 s5 s61 okay with the, uh, the with the unique smooth structure only this dimension possible so they have in fact proved 
because the s s21 the up to um, uh, 12 milner itself it's clear only 61 not clear but this uh, due to rank result 60 61 also now clear and also separately they have proved that these are the only possible all dimensional sphere has a unique sum structures not other dimension in fact they have much more uh, proved that in the dimension 5 to 61 the only dimension sn has a unique sum structure only these are the dimension included 56 that is also they have proved and uh, later on some of the uh, most stuff in the stable homotopy theory computation why up to you are restricting 61 in fact it is a, a true for the, any dimension greater than 4 the only sphere with the unique sum structure only these are the dimension so even 56 itself admit a unique sum structure uh, from this result one can able to understand but completely we know the such a result uh, in 64 and after 64 this uh, uh, wang and zu they have conjectured that th these are the only possible greater than 4 the only dimension has a unique smooth structures these are the only 5 6 12 56 and 61 and uh, the, these are the now uh, recently update about uh, this along this directions is, is a is a very uh, uh, I'm, i started understanding those computations now Uh, slightly uh, uh, started uh, and uh, but those uh, idea uh, I, I, in my in my view point those idea even one can carry it out for uh, arbitrary manifolds also uh, by just taking connected sums with exotic sphere for arbitrary manifolds so anyway that that computation is more much helpful for for other kind of manifolds also but this talk is one of the consequence for that computation For even for example, for the complex projective spaces. So I just quickly recall that the sum structure means it's just a homeomorphism from sum structure on here the fixed manifold M. What is the meaning that is there is a homeomorphism from some smooth manifold to the given manifold M. Okay, with this ref reference map, one can start to understand that instead of uh, for understanding the diffeomorphism classes of the Uh, 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 if you uh, the sum structure on the manifold M, first we will understand the some weaker relation, namely maybe we can say that stronger relation also, the, namely isotopy. First we will understand up to isotopy what are the possible sum structure on a given manifold M. From that we can reduce the uh, problem up to diffeomorphism what are the possible, okay, natural way. Okay, that is the fundamental work he is reflecting. so there now i will define what is maybe up to the uh, isotopy therefore two smooth structures they are concordant okay these are the another relations i will i will uh, say that it is equivalent to isotopy okay what is the meaning that there exists a diffeomorphism from that the domain n1 to n2 so that uh, n1 cross closed interval 0 1 the cylinder cylinder over n1 to the cylinder over m m is fixed okay there is a homeomorphisms so that at the cylinder one end is a one differentiable structure namely h1 another end is just a composition with that homium uh, diffeomorphism phi is another end of the cylinder okay so the uh, is a concordant means there is a smooth structure on the cylinder so that on the one end is a one smooth structure another end is another smooth structure but in between it may not be preserved okay each the cylinder each copy of the cylinder that uh, corresponding uh, differentiable structure may not be preserved under the concordance if it is preserved that is called isotopy that's what uh, oh, oh sorry Uh, sorry exactly i have to i have to talk oh sorry
we can see your screen but not your slide oh oh slide oh, now it's okay no yes. it's okay oh yes. sorry, sorry sorry for interrupt no problem mm. okay. uh, so uh, uh, isotope means uh, on the cylinder one end is a given one another one another smooth structure and between each level each level that uh, same smooth, smooth structure carry so that's what the isotope is. that means each t the fixed t the smooth structure here the image is inside the m cross t for each t there is a level preserving that uh, from one end to another end we have to preserve the smooth structures so uh, it's clear that uh, if it is isotopy it's clear that from one end smooth structure the another end we have two smooth structure they are diffeomorphic because in each level they are diffeomorphic copy and so that uh, later on uh, due to qb saberman is a fundamental work uh, in the geometry topology so that the concordant the higher dimensional case concordant on, uh, and isotopy the level preserving each uh, level preserving a uh, smooth structure and uh, only on the end point preserve smooth structure namely concordant both notions are coincide uh, for higher dimensional cases okay some of the lower dimensional namely the four uh, four dimensional cases some somewhat one can able to build up uh, they are different okay and uh, so the up to isotopy uh, these, this is the equivalence relation i am collecting all those equivalence relations i will denote that is a c of m script script c of m what is the mean by, meaning that is c of m this is precisely the collections of all smooth structure of the manifold m up to concordant the relation equivalence relation up to concordant okay so concordant implies diffeomorphism but diffeomorphism need not be implies concordant that example we can we can pick from the milner work namely in the standard sphere s7 on the standard sphere s7 uh, each uh, the theta 7 theta 7 they are each uh, smooth structure is uh, the oriented diffeomorphism classes so you can use a reflection map reflection map is a uh, reversing orientation reversing diffeomorphism therefore you can pull back that diffeomorphism of the uh, uh, in the theta 7 the element of the theta 7 you can pull back that element under reflection map then you will get another copy of uh, uh, an element of the theta 7 but those are those are the uh, 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 not same element in the theta 7 okay so in this way one can able to build up the uh, to give a example for uh, the diffeomorphisms but need not be a concordance so this is the way one can able to uh, give a example for that understanding so because of that uh, uh, classification concordance then one can able to uh, try to understand the up to isotopic classification then you can carry it out up to diffeomorphism why that is that's a very easy to look at because the directly that uh, the, the method and the theory uh, for finding diffeomorphism classes directly is, there is no tools to try directly directly look at up to we can convert into some some what the serger theory or some of the abstraction theory the fundamental building uh, that uh, bundle theory first look at up to isotopy then you can bring into uh, diff up to diffeomorphism that is the way the fundamental work is reflecting so now here in in this uh, recently i submitted for regard for complex projective spaces so i have observed that up to isotopy these are the geometrically one can able to build up the short short exact sequence from that one can able to compute for example there is a bijective map on the m equal to 4 on the four dimensional complex projective spaces there is a uh, exact sequence namely there is a bijective in fact theta 8 and c of cp cp4 so they are is isomorphisms in fact they are the group isomorphisms okay so theta 8 means there is a z2 there are two element only possible theta 8 means there are two smooth structure possible on up to diffeomorphism up to oriented diffeomorphism there are two smooth structure possible on s8 and eight dimensional spheres so that eight dimensional sphere corresponding you will get here exactly two distinct smooth structure on cp4 so on the complex four dimensional complex projective space up to isotopy there are exactly two smooth structure possible not more than that in particularly those two smooth structure is coming from corresponding uh, the element of theta a. namely here take an element uh, sigma and this is the map this, this is a degree one map induced degree one degree one map given sigma that image element is precisely cp4 connected some sigma okay they connected some with the exotic sphere that is the image element of this map okay so here standard sphere s8 and another non trivial element sigma there are two element 
standard sphere will go into cp4 standard smooth structure cp4 and the sigma will go into cp4 connected some sigma the connected sum of cp4 with the, that sigma that is the non trivial element here so cp4 exactly 2 up to isotopy then next one we can go build up by induction somewhat by using long exact sequence of the uh, homotopy uh, homotopy uh, cofiber sequence i don't want to go in, inside that just i want to reflect the idea that one can one once we know the cp4 here you see that there is a split shot exact sequence so we for understand after understanding cp4 then you can compare with the theta 10 why we theta 10 is coming because it is a 10 dimensional manifold cp5 is a 10 dimensional manifold therefore the corresponding one can able to make it this is the injective map here you have surjective map and there is a splitting here therefore cp5 the up to isotopy is coming from theta 10 as well as cp4 theta 10 is 6 element cp4 is a 8 element therefore one can build one can able to try to compute Uh, c of the i mean the up to isotopy on cp5 there is a split exact sequence similarly here here there is a map here here there are geometric maps corresponding there are geometric mapping so but here uh, because of short time i would not able to discuss then on cp5 see sorry cp6 there is a similar analog uh, short exact sequence but here cp5 to theta 11 there is a map namely half vibration so this map is induced map by uh, by half vibration okay so cp5 uh, yes uh, yes 11 to cp5 there is a natural half vibration quotient map under that quotient map induced map here there is a corresponding given any smooth structure we can go down on the pull back by a half vibration some uh, then one can able to uh, build up a smooth structure on theta 7 but uh, we can able to understand by using stable homotopy theory algebraic topology really is helpful for here so that this image is precisely z2 not the entire theta 1 theta 11 is only z2 and the theta uh, i mean cp6 one can compute via this okay, this is injective map that one can able to compute so this is a way one can able to understand geometrically for smooth structures what about cp7 same thing is a theta 14 they are always injective here similar analog uh, in the, here you not half vibration induced map here inclusion cp6 to cp7 there is a inclusion map that corresponding induced map here but in fact its image is not entire cp6 is z2 only uh, two elements one is the, that zero uh, and the, another non trivial element so here here itself one can able to compute similarly cp8 here also theta 16 theta 14 they are only two elements so from this short exact sequence one can able to compute the smooth structure on the complex projective space up to up to isotopy not diffeomorphism up to isotopy okay so now then started understanding how to bring this result for up to diffeomorphism that is the next natural way idea so that's the natural uh, natural uh, uh, result saying that uh, the up to isotopy there is a actions of the 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 equivalence classes of the isotopy classes of the homeomorphism self homeomorphism of cpm what is this a mapping class group mapping class group of the cpm the isotopy here isotopy means topological isotopy okay the isotopy class topological isotopy classes of the self homeomorphism of cpm that is that is a, this group so this group naturally there is a action on this smooth structure given any homeomorphism self homeomorphism you just uh, take a post composition given any element here uh, self homeomorphism given any uh, smooth structure you just uh, make a post composition then it will produce another element here okay so this is a natural actions and uh, this actions you can easily do uh, you can find the orbit space that is precisely the oriented diffeomorphism classes of the smooth structures of, of cpm so we want to understand this action we, we have to compute the orbit of this action but in general it's very difficult to understand this action even you in via surgery theory but particularly uh, some special kind of uh, nice object but one can able to build up even though for this cpm also somewhat uh, hard to find for higher dimensional but at least up to cp uh cpm or m less than or equal to 8 at least uh, here i have discussed so uh, uh, that's this uh, uh, mapping class groups 
is uh, computable due to uh, Denis Sullivan result abstraction theory. When M is even, so there are two element identity and C is a conjugation conjugation map, namely this complex conjugation map. But M is odd only we are taking identity. Okay. So there, there are only uh, for M is odd case only this is a trivial group. Therefore, immediately that up to isotopy is equivalent to uh, up to diffeomorphism. Where M is even, there are two elements, namely conjugation. So we want to understand the conjugation action. After understanding conjugation action, only one can be able to say uh, what are the full uh, group. So here I have discussed uh, this understanding the map, the conjugation action map from this isotopic uh, set to isotopic set. This conjugation map is precisely this. Okay, but we want to understand these homeomorphisms. But whether this homeomorphism is a trivial homeomorphism or non-trivial homeomorphism, that's what we want to start understand. So uh, that uh, homeomorphism geometrically one can convert it into homotopy theory, namely the group of homotopy classes of the map from C M to top mod O. Top mod O is the fiber of the uh, B O. The classification space of the orthogonal group B O to B top. You take a homotopy fiber that is a top mod O. So by using this observation, one can try to understand the uh, this homomorphisms. So I will uh, uh, just quickly uh, uh, try to finish it uh, sure. by using this uh, uh, convert conversion I mean, to homotopy T. Exact. Uh, Maybe two minutes. Yeah, two minutes. That will be fine. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. So uh, I understood the conjugation actions. Uh, somewhat uh, by using the homotopy theory, stable homotopy theory, the calculation of the, uh, the uh, homotopy, uh, stable homotopy groups of spheres is nice. Uh, look at the generator. These are the correspondent generator. Uh, some of the generators coming from stable homotopy group of spheres. So here I have computed that uh, explicitly that action of the conjugation action. By using that action, then uh, the orbit space is precisely this. So CP4, there are two elements, and uh, CP5, these are the guru, uh, uh, as I said, here there is no group structure. As I said, these are the uh, possible uh, uh, diffeomorphism classes sets. So up to CP8. So up to diffeomorphism, one can be able to understand these elements. So now I will stop So the uh, here. Uh, and uh, the further, I just want to uh, uh, state the, uh, the final case, uh, sorry, in this case, so I have discussed up to uh, homotopy equivalent also, homotopy type also, I have yeah. discussed. The later here so jumps some error, okay, typing error. There are the famous conjectures still is unknown, up to uh, tangential homotopy equivalent of particularly in these dimensions, what are the possible smooth manifolds? There, there, there will be a conjecture is along this direction. And uh, so I will stop now here. So there are many interesting problems, even for example, come real project spaces, and some of the uh, uh, ex uh, familiar manifolds also still a lot of the problems are there. Uh, one can look at the same kind of analog idea. One can look at those those arbitrary manifolds also. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. And you, if you want, you can. These are the reference. Maybe you can look at the archive available. If you want, you can look at. Let us thank Ramesh for his uh, wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry that we are completely out of time, so we yeah, cannot I take understand. questions now. Uh, let us move on to the next uh, talk. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, the next speaker is um, uh, Reza D'Souza. Uh, she is from St. Joseph College. I'm sorry, please correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. She did her uh, PhD at uh, IIT Madras some two, three years back. Uh, she will talk on topology of real bot manifolds. So. Yes, thank you, sir. Yeah. Um, Reza, can you please uh, upload your uh, slide? Yes. Yes. Send you, sir. So, uh, I hope it's visible. Yes, it is visible now. Okay, okay, good, thank mm. you. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Shankaran sir for inviting me to give this talk and uh, also the local organizers for getting in touch with us. Uh, so what I'll be speaking on today is uh, the topology of real bot manifolds. Now, uh, 
these are um, interesting topological objects and they are examples of uh, more general objects known as small covers so i will first uh, discuss what a small cover is and then talk about real bot manifolds and, and uh, then the acyclic digraphs which i will bring uh, to the picture right so what is a small cover a small cover is a smooth manifold a smooth real manifold with a locally standard action of the uh, real two torus so when i say z2 n here z2 is nothing but the multiplicative group plus minus 1 right and uh, the orbit space of the structure has the structure of an n dimensional simple polytope okay so what do we mean by locally standard it means that you know uh, locally like around a neighborhood of each point the action looks like the standard action of z to n on rn which is based so more technically what we would say is uh, every point of m has a z to n invariant neighborhood that is diffeomorphic to an open subset of rn which is invariant under the standard z to n action and also this is this diffeomorphism is equivariant in the set, sense that uh, there is an automorphism of z to n with itself uh, you know such that this condition holds right now uh, the easy non trivial example of a small cover is the real projective space which we all know is uh, you know the space obtained by identifying lines through the origin so uh, how does this have a locally standard action uh, so you just you know take the the normal uh, the standard action of z to n plus 1 on rn plus 1 and let it descend to a z to n action on rpn uh, via you know identifying z to n with this uh, quotient group here right and the natural covering of rpn makes this uh, a locally standard action and therefore makes rpn into a small cover with the orbit space being nothing but the n simplex which uh, is a simple convex polytope and uh, what exactly do we mean by simple convex polytope so set is a co dimension one face of the polytope and uh, at any given vertex of the polytope if exactly n facets meet then you call the uh, convex polytope right now uh, there is a more uh, what do you say a more combinatorial way of describing uh, small covers which i will come to in a moment okay and those are gotten by what are known as characteristic functions so a characteristic function is a function from the set of facets of a polytope to uh, z to n such that whenever a bunch of facets intersect the corresponding lambda values form a part of a basis of z to uh, z to n right and uh, uh, any uh, small cover in fact determines a characteristic function all right but uh, what i'll be focusing here is not how a small cover determines a characteristic function but more more like the reverse construction where you know you start with a function having this property here okay and you uh, you construct a small cover from that so how do you do that you you given by davis in the seminal paper and uh, the way that small covers are constructed is you start uh, with this product okay and define an equivalence relation on it where two points are equivalent if uh, the p and q are equal in the polytope and uh, h inverse g belongs to this subgroup gf so uh, this subgroup is essentially you know uh, you look at the face the unique face which contains the point p in its relative interior and uh, look at all the face sets that you know make up this face and uh, generate gf by the span of the uh, you know the uh, images of those face sets okay so uh, there is of course a natural action of z to n on uh, z to n cross p and this descends to an action on uh, m lambda which is a locally standard action right and the natural projection map also descends which makes it into a you know this projection map essentially becomes your uh, orbit map and uh, the simple convex polytope p is going to be the uh, the orbit space okay so this is how uh, you construct a small cover from a polytope using a characteristic function right now uh, let's just quickly look at an example so 
we already dealt with the, you know it more generally earlier but still uh, if you take just a triangle okay the facets are nothing but the edges of the triangle okay and uh, there is essentially just one characteristic function that you can define from this uh, triangle to the which is the following right uh, so i'll show it to you pictorially uh, this uh, you see here uh, you know the each edge is given uh, a certain value and wherever two edges intersect okay that is these two facets intersect the corresponding lambda and values uh, should form a part of the basis for z2 in this case uh, since there are you know two facets intersecting at uh, uh, this vertex here you you just get a basis for z2 square Right? And the small cover that you get corresponding to this is uh, nothing but your real projective space. Right? Uh, now we'll look at another class of examples, which uh, you know you start off with defining the small cover over a one simplex now, and keep building up from there, uh, which gives us basically iterated S one bundles. Right. So uh, let us see that. So uh, you see, if you just take the one. Uh, endpoints of that line are the facets. Okay, so uh, these do not the, these two facets do not in them both the value one. Okay, and that is the characteristic function that we have, and uh, that gives us the small cover uh, S one. Okay, the circle. So it's just uh, it's the you know the usual you know identifying a, uh, the it's a, it's a similar. Gives you the quotient page space as the circle, right? Now uh, we next look at the product of two one simplices, okay, which is basically a square, and uh, you just you know look at each of the facets of the square. Now I'm particularly denoting the facets like this, which are the edges of the square like this, so that you understand that they have come from you know uh, uh, i cross i. Okay, so you identify them as how they are related to the one dimension uh, to the single copy of this one simplex, right? And uh, given any characteristic, uh, given any function, uh, we can define a characteristic function, uh, you know, from the facet set of the square to z two square, okay, which is as follows. Now, depending on what your value of gamma is, you will get uh, different small covers. Right, and these the small cover corresponding to this lambda tilde, in fact, is very interesting because uh, it has a very nice structure, which is that of a S one bundle over S one. You know, it in fact you can uh, show that it is uh, uh, diffeomorphic to the the direct sum one and L, where L can either be the trivial bundle over S one or the Mobius bundle. Okay, and uh, depending on what we have, if we have the trivial bundle, then the m lambda, the small cover that we get, is going to be the torus. And if we take L to be the Mobius bundle, then the small cover we get is the Klein bottle. Okay, so uh, so far these are objects that we are all familiar with. Right now, this process can be iterated further. So you started with the one simplex, you went to i cross i. Now you can go to i cross i cross i. Okay, that is the three cube. So uh, when you do that, you end up with either uh, you know S one bundle over the torus or the Klein bottle, okay? And you can, uh, which is essentially a small cover over the three cube, and you can keep iterating this process, uh, you know, n times over to give you a small cover over the n cube, and uh, this essentially is the real bot manifold. So let me just quickly, you know, summarize what what I just said. So a real bot tower is basically this iterated sequence of S one bundles, starting with the point, and your y one here is just going to be S one, and then you keep moving on in the same way, okay? By uh, you know each subsequent uh, stage, you projectivize the direct sum of the trivial and any line bundle over the previous stage uh, manifold, and at each stage, the manifold that you get is known as a bot manifold. Okay, so at the end stage, we just say it is a both manifold of dimension n. Right now, uh, how is this a small cover? Of course, uh, you know you can uh, what to say. You can number the facets of the simple convex polytope. Okay, there are uh, uh, two n facets for the n cube, right? And uh, you define the characteristic function as follows. So for the first n facets, you just uh, send it to the uh, standard basis of z two n. 
right? And for the remaining facets, you have to make sure you send it to, uh, you know, uh, to basis elements in such a way that uh, that characteristic function condition is satisfied, you know, at the intersection, uh, whenever facets intersect, what you get is a part of a basis of Z to N, right? So uh, these, uh, these CIJs are nothing but elements of Z to N, okay? And uh, these essentially determine your bot manifold, okay? So I think another uh, particular notation is used in some time, okay? This, uh, the, you know, pre-image of any face set it, under the st uh, standard projection is, uh, uh, you know, a characteristic sub-manifold, uh, which we will uh, use later, right? So these, um, uh, these numbers that we have here, you know, the CJKs, uh, they are known as bot numbers. Right, and uh, you can you know essentially put them into a matrix, which we call the bot matrix. So it's just the you know the first n facets we just had uh, what is it called? They were uh, they just gave you the standard basis uh, vectors of Z to n as their images. So if you put those into columns of a matrix, you're just going to get the identity matrix. Okay, so that is not very interesting. It's the second half of the matrix that's interesting. And it's only that part that we will consider, which is a square matrix, right? And um, just uh, for a convention, which I will come to in a moment, we, you know, we eliminate the diagonal entries, which are all ones, okay? So that we get a strictly upper triangular matrix of uh, zero ones, right? So uh, this is called the bot matrix. Right, and uh, the topology of bot manifolds is, you know, completely determined uh, using the, uh, uh, by studying the properties of this matrix, right? So for example, um, uh, so Kamishima and Masuda gave a complete characterization of the cohomology ring of, uh, you know, uh, the n-dimensional bot Uh, variables uh, mod the ideal which is given here and this ideal is generated by uh, you know this uh, okay you, you'll have to tell me if my voice is breaking or something because I keep getting a, your internet connection is unstable message here okay. so um, all right uh, to moving on so this um, uh, this uh, cohomology ring is nothing but you know um, this R mod I and the isomorphism is given using those characteristic submanifolds uh, that we saw earlier which is you look at the uh, you know the uh, class in the first cohomology group and send that to the uh, xi plus one which is uh, you know the uh, generator for this particular idea uh, for this particular ring right and they are isomorphic as uh, graded z2 algebras. Now, uh, using this cohomology ring structure, we can, uh, you know, even compute the uh, Stiefel-Whitney classes, all right? And the vanishing of the Stiefel-Whitney classes uh, lead us to several properties of the bot manifolds. For example, uh, the orientability of bot manifolds can be studied. So as we know, a vector bundle is orientable if uh, its structure group can be reduced to the special orthogonal group. And a manifold is orientable if the you know, frame bundle associated to its tangent bundle can be reduced to a principal uh, special orthogonal group bundle, SON bundle. Okay. So uh, an equivalent condition for orientability of manifolds is that the first Stiefel-Whitney class vanishes. Right? And by computing the uh, vanishing of the first uh, Stiefel-Whitney class, uh, you know, one concludes that the uh, bot manifold is orientable if uh, this condition is satisfied. Now, what is this condition? Uh, it is just, you know, saying that the sums of the rows of, of the bot matrix are even, okay? That is, they are congruent to zero mod two. So uh, you see how nice this result is. It just, you know, uh, pulls down the, uh, 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 the difficult uh, notion of finding the orient of a manifold to a more combinatorial criterion. So it's very easy now to guess which among the real bot manifolds are oriented. Right? And uh, similarly, in the next stage, you have, uh, you know, uh, the lifting of uh, this uh, tangent bundle now to a uh, principal spin n bundle, right? So uh, when such a thing happens, you say that the manifold has a spin structure. 
you know, spin structure can be characterized by the vanishing of stiefel whitney classes. So the first and second stiefel whitney class should vanish, right? And again, combinatorially, you can get the condition for uh, real bot manifolds, right? So the first condition is just the orientability condition. Okay, and the second condition determines when a spin, uh, when an orientable bot manifold is spin, right? And again, involved row sums of just one row at a time. The second condition involves row sums taking two rows at a time and uh, certain combinations of them, right? So uh, these are just a few of the things. Of course, one can ask now about the vanishing of uh, uh, higher Whitney classes, okay? Um, the still closed formulae for the Whitney classes are uh, still. There is one more thing, which is that of, uh, you know, the null cobordance. So, uh, you know, a manifold is said to be null cobordant if it can be thought of as the boundary of uh, a higher dimensional manifold, right? So, uh, any bot manifold is in fact null cobordant. Okay, you can uh, see this in several ways, one of which is by seeing that the uh, stiefel whitney numbers of all the bot manifolds vanish. Okay. Uh, now, right. so, uh, okay, so uh, these were the properties of bot manifolds that could be from the bot matrix. Uh, there we will now come to an interesting uh, notion that is uh, the comparison of uh, uh, bot manifolds to acyclic diagrams. Okay, so uh, let me tell you what that is. First of all, uh, a graph, of course, is a collection of vertices or nodes uh, with edges between these nodes, and an edge is nothing but uh, you know a vertices. So here so you know the uh, that's why we say ordered pairs of vertices so it is very important whether the edge is from wj to ui okay and we only look at uh, you know uh, simple graphs that is graphs where there are no self loops there are no double multiple edges right uh, so uh, when when we look at such a graph the adjacency matrix of this graph which is you know uh, the matrix uh, where you put in an entry one if there is an edge from the ith to the j matrix is one in that case and zero otherwise right so the adjacency matrix then is just going to be uh, for a simple directed graph it's going to be a zero one matrix with diagonal entry zero now, if you recall a little while earlier, the bot matrix is uh, also a zero one matrix with diagonal entry zero, right? So this naturally, you know, uh, uh, gives us a relation between uh, acyclic diagram uh, between digraphs and uh, bot manifolds, right? So given any bot matrix, you can think of it as the adjacency matrix of a digraph, and hence uh, uh, define a digraph out of it. Okay, and there is something even more particular about these particular objects, which is, uh, you know, you can, uh, since the matrix is strictly upper triangular, you can order the vertices in such a way that, you know, there is no, no directed cycle in the graph. So, uh, so essentially that becomes an acyclic directed graph, okay, or an acyclic digraph. So what do I mean by that? If you look at these two examples here, uh, the first example is uh, an acyclic directed graph, okay? So there is no cycle here. No matter how you reorder the vertices, it uh, doesn't matter. Like however you renumber them, uh, there will still be no directed cycle, okay? However, the second graph, it is uh, very clearly has a directed cycle. Correspondingly, look at the adjacency matrix Right, uh, no permutation of the rows and columns of this matrix are going to make it a strictly upper triangular matrix. Right, so uh, that is how you identify an acyclic digraph, and uh, that is why we say that you know, corresponding to a bot ma manifold or a bot matrix, you can get an acyclic digraph. Right, now, uh, why is this so interesting? Uh, because you know, it uh, completely brings a combinatorial touch into the problem. Right. Uh, the problem being uh, of classification, right? Now, uh, acyclic digraphs can be actually classified up to uh, 
isomorphism of graphs, all right, uh, bar certain other conditions, which I will talk about in a moment. And uh, this helps us to classify the uh, uh, n-dimensional bot manifolds up to diffeomorphism. Right? So there are three operations that are allowable on acyclic digraphs. All right. Uh, one, of course, is the renumbering of vertices. Then the second one is called a local complementation. So it is better understood using this picture. Uh, so uh, you see this first figure here, this is the directed graph that we start with. Okay, you fix any vertex V and we talk about D star V, which is the local complementation of D with respect to V, right? How do you define it? Now you look at all the vertices, uh, you know, which are neighbors of V. When I say neighbors, I mean either they have an edge which goes into V or which uh, uh, comes out of V. Right? So let me just concentrate on the two vertices here. So the first one is this, which you know, which is a in neighbor of V, which means you have an edge going into V. And the second is this one, which is an out neighbor of V because you have an edge going out of V. Right? So the local complementation graph, it has the same vertex set as well as edge set except uh, you remove any edge which is of this form, that is, which is from a in neighbor to an out neighbor of V, okay? And if there was no edge from an in neighbor to an out neighbor of V in the uh, graph you started with, then you add that edge, okay? So this was the edge which was removed in the complementation and the edge here was added in the complementation. So this is a local complementation uh, graph. And if you started with an acyclic graph, you will uh, again get an acyclic graph under local complementation. Okay. The next operation is what is known as a slide. Okay. Um, in this case, you fix two vertices. And I think again, the picture will be clearer. So you see, uh, you fix two vertices of the graph. All right. And you take the first vertex, which is U, and look at its out neighbors. So for this graph, the out neighbors of U are both these vertices on the top. Then you look at V and you see whether V has an edge from it from it to any of the out neighbors of U. Okay, so if there was such an edge, then you remove it, right? And if there wasn't such an edge, then you add it, right? So this operation is known as a slide. Now, uh, the very nice result of uh, Choi Masuda. what you see, modulo these three operations and isomorphism of acyclic digraphs, uh, we can associate bot manifolds diffume up to diffeomorphism with these uh, digraphs. So, you know, what you can essentially do is uh, you identify a, a bot manifold with an acyclic digraph. And if you get two non-isomorphic acyclic digraphs, then the corresponding bot manifolds are also non-diffeomorphic. Right. And this essentially helps you to count the actual number of real bot manifolds of dimension n. Now, again, you can, you know, add in the extra condition that, you know, the rows, I mean, should be even and so on uh, uh, for the graph as well. Okay, which is essentially saying that, you know, the graph has even, every vertex of the graph has even out degree. Okay, so uh, when you do that, you can, and further counter. Okay. So I think um, I will end now with uh, talking about a few generalizations, right? Uh, so the uh, bot manifolds that we spoke of, these were uh, of one simplices, right? We can talk about uh, small covers over the product of any simplices. Uh, this uh, this object is actually what is known as a generalized real bot manifold. Okay, and the topology of these objects are also um, quite extensively studied. For example, orientability, spin, and cobordism is already studied for these objects. Okay, uh, in fact, I should mention that orientability is in, is studied for all small covers. I guess I forgot to put in the reference. It is uh, it was studied by uh, Nakamura and Nishimura. So. Um, Sim uh, uh, to the way uh, bot manifolds were studied, uh, if there is a graph theoretic connection to uh, generalized bot manifolds and uh, you know uh, 
I, I wouldn't say acyclic digraphs because uh, maybe multi edges and so on will come into the picture here. So um, these are yet to be explored. And you know, perhaps if such a connection is established, we can even uh, talk about classifying these objects. So uh, thank you. Let us thank uh, Reza for her talk. Uh, we have time for just one question, if anybody wants to ask. Well, if there are no questions, uh, let us thank the speaker once again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. So we move on to the last talk of uh, this session. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Harish Yashadri. Uh, he is uh, at uh, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He did his PhD at uh, Stony Brook in New York. And uh, his talk, uh, the title of his talk is On the Volume of Hino manifolds. Harish Shashadri. Sir, sir, please unmute, sir. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, okay. Thanks to permission, the organizers, for giving me a chance to speak here. Let me begin my talk. Um, right. Uh, oh, first I have to do screen sharing, I guess. Uh, Yes, sir. Yes, please share your screen. <laughs> uh, let me see. Share. It's a green arrow at the bottom that says yes. green share screen. Yes, I got it. Yes. Okay. Um, right. So now, uh, is this uh, visible? No, I only. Uh, my notes are they visible? No. Oh no. Okay, fine. Let me try again. Share screen. Yeah, is it visible now? Yes. Yes. Now it is very much visible. Okay. Good. Thanks. Uh, so uh, let me start with this. Uh, uh, giving a brief uh, motivation for what I'm about to talk about. This, uh, from uh, at least from my point of view, since I work in uh, Riemannian geometry mainly rather than Keller geometry. So I'll start with the classical result in Riemannian geometry, the namely the Bishop volume comparison theorem. So this goes back all the way back to 1950s or 19, early 1960s. So this states that if you have a, if MN G, N being the dimension of the of M, is a compact Riemannian manifold. The main assumption is main and in fact the only assumption is that the Ricci curvature of this is greater than or equal to N minus one G. Now, the significance of this assumption <clears throat> that if you look at the standard sphere, which I've written as Sn comma G naught, so it's just the sphere of radius one with center origin in nuclei Rn plus one with the induced metric. If you look at this, then the induced metric has this property that the Ricci curvature is exactly equal to n minus one times the metric. Here we are assuming that um, <clears throat> the Ricci curvature is greater than or equal to n minus one times the metric. The conclusion is that the volume of the manifold has to be less than the volume of the standard sphere. 
So loosely uh, phrased, what uh, this assumption means that in some sense, uh, the Ricci curvature of our given manifold is more than that of the sphere. It's not, I mean, literally speaking, that's, uh, it doesn't make sense because the Ricci tensor <clears throat> here, when I say curvature, it's not a number, it's a two tensor. So one can't literally compare the curvature of uh, Ricci curvature of MN and SN. But this, uh, this inequality here sort of uh, is based on the loose idea that the Ricci curvature is more than what it would be for the corresponding, the sphere of uh, the corresponding dimension. And the more the curvature, at least in the positive case, the one can expect the manifold to have smaller diameter, smaller volume, et cetera. And that's uh, the volume is, uh, the smallness of the volume is what is being asserted here. Now, and of course there are, uh, <coughs> Mm, uh, yeah, uh, well, okay. So this is what one has here. Now let's move over to Kähler manifolds. So recall that these are complex manifolds. So here uh, <clears throat> M is a smooth manifold with an almost complex structure which is integrable and a metric, which is uh, what, what is called a Kähler metric. So I won't go into the definition of this, but essentially the metric is Hermitian and uh, the natural connection of the metric preserves the almost complex structure. That's uh, <coughs> what a Kähler manifold is. In this, uh, when we are in the setting of Kähler manifolds, uh, one would like to have a similar theorem that if Ricci curvature is more than that of some standard space, here the standard space was the sphere, then um, the volume has to be less than the volume of that particular standard space. Well, the first thing is the, what is the right standard space? the sphere no longer works since uh, sphere is not even a complex manifold for uh, <coughs> other than dimension one and six is unknown. Anyway, it's certainly not a Kähler manifold beyond dimension one. So it turns out that the right analog of uh, the sphere is a complex projective space with its canonical metric near the... Now, in, uh, there are various ways in which uh, this can be seen to be the right analog. One direct way is that the significance of SN in the real case is that, uh, <clears throat> well, in this case, of course, I already said that the Ricci curvature is actually equal to this for the sphere with the round metric. But uh, the, that's not the main point. The main point is that the sphere with the round metric has constant sectional curvature. Identically one. So, that is the, and it turns out that that is the only, uh, and it, uh, yeah, well, locally, this, uh, the geometry of the sphere determines any manifold which has this property. So in other words, if a Riemannian manifold has constant sectional curvature identically one, then locally it's isometric to the sphere with uh, <coughs> the round sphere of radius one. And, um, in fact, if you assume that the given manifold is simply connected, it's globally isometric to this angle. So this is a sort of universal object 
with uh, this property, constant curvature, sectional curvature one. In the Kähler setting, one can, uh, that cannot happen in fact, that one cannot have a Kähler manifold with constant sectional curvature one, precisely for the reason that I just said, it will have to be then locally isometric to the sphere, which, was, which is not even locally Kähler. So the, on the other hand, if one looks at holomorphic sectional curvature, Holomorph uh, with suitable normalizations of G naught, the ho by holomorphic sectional curvature, one just means the usual sectional curvature, but you just look at, instead of looking at all two dimensional subspaces of tangent spaces, you just look at those two dimensional, real two dimensional subspaces, which are invariant under J, the almost complex structure. In other words, you look at complex lines in the tangent space. And uh, you and then you look at the sectional curvature of those subspaces. You demand that if one requires that that's constant, a positive constant, then one can prove that locally any such Kähler manifold is isometric to CPN with the standard metric. And again, globally, if one assumes simply connected, then one can see that it's actually equal to, it's uh, globally isometric to CPN with the Fubini Studi metric. Well, okay, so that's uh, why one would look at CPN as an analog of SN. And again, just like the, just like the case of the sphere, the Ricci curvature of this Fubini Studi metric satisfies this condition that it's a multiple of the metric. This is, by the way, this is known as the, in this case, it's Kähler Einstein, but in general, when the Ricci curvature is a multiple of the constant multiple of the metric, then uh, the Riemannian manifold is said to be Einstein. So this is indeed Einstein. Now this n, but the constant is a slightly different story here. Here n was the real dimension of uh, the real dimension of the sphere, and you get a n minus one. While here n is the complex dimension, so the real dimension would be two n. And besides, one is also getting a plus one. So it's let's not worry too much about this. But the point is that this this is Einstein. And the, so this is used, basically one would like to use this as the reference. So whatever statement one wants to make in the for an analog of Bishop's theorem, if one looks at CPN, one has this equation. So an analog of Bishop's theorem in the Kähler setting uh, would be the following. So I start with a compact Kähler n-manifold with Ricci curvature greater than or equal to n plus one g, keeping in mind that here it's actually equal to n plus one g. Then one would like to assert that the volume of such a manifold is less than or equal to the volume of the uh, volume of CPN with the Fubini Studi metric. Now, surprisingly, this is a very natural result, and it was probably the question was known for about forty or fifty years. Uh, but it is quite difficult to prove. I mean, it was proved only last year for this result. What I just stated for the, in the Kähler setting was proved only in 2019. So the proof of Bishop's theorem is uh, by now, after so many decades, uh, it's quite elementary. And uh, 
any introductory textbook of uh, on Riemannian geometry contains the proof. It's just based on some uh, comparison geometry, Jacobi field estimates, and things like that. But this is a uh, the case. Harish, uh, we are not able to hear you. Some audio problem? Wait, let me just check. No, so it is not audible, but the screen is, uh, I mean, the. Ah. Yeah, the, we are not able to see your notes. Now you are audible. Ah, but when I, when I had the screen, am I audible now? Now you are audible and your screen is visible. Please go on. Oh, okay. Um, so was I not audible throughout or only? No, no, no. just for one minute, for a few, half a minute. Oh, I see. Now, now you are now okay. Maybe it's uh, again an internet connection problem. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, okay, the settings are fine. Uh, so let me continue. Yeah, if I'm uh, not audible, please let me know. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Um, right, so the, this was, yeah, as I said, the, so this... This result of Zhang, uh, which is uh, the Keller analog of Bishop's theorem, was uh, proved in 2019 and it uh, involves uh, quite non trivial results from very recent algebraic uh, geometry. So, um, one would like to give a, a differential geometric proof of this. After all, it's a very natural statement in differential geometry. So, but uh, so far, the Nobody has come up with that, but I mean, it's still, uh, it's only an year since this result appeared. So maybe it will come up. But um, <clears throat> now let me, uh, in fact, uh, our interest, this whatever I'm speaking about is joint work with my colleague Ved, Ved Dattar and his uh, thesis advisor, Jian Song. Our early interest in this problem was to give just a differential geometric proof of this result. We were uh, not successful in that, but there are other aspects to this, which we later explore. For that, uh, let me go back to the Riemannian setting again. Now, almost four decades after Bishop's uh, original volume comparison result, this uh, topic of volumes of Kähler manifolds, uh, volume of, of Riemannian manifolds with positive Ricci curvature was revisited by uh, Kolding in the <clears throat> to understand his statements and to in fact understand what our main result is, I have to talk a bit about. So Kolding revisited this in the context of gromov host of uh, distance. Let me, no, instead of saying convergence, let me just say gromov host of distance. So <clears throat> this is a, by now it's a very uh, prominent, uh, it's a prominent, very, widely used notion in uh, geometry, even in uh, algebraic geometry having to do with Kähler-Einstein metrics, certainly metric geometry, Riemannian geometry. So what is, it's a very simple notion. So it's a notion of a distance between two metric spaces. So for simplicity, let me start with two compact metric spaces, xd1, yd2. And I say that um, I would like to say when they're close in some sense. Now, if these two metric spaces were subsets of a larger metric space, then one has a very classical notion of closeness, namely the host of distance between compact subsets of a metric space. In fact, one can pursue that uh, uh, definition and sort of uh, uh, 
enhance it and define gromov host of distance that's what gromov did originally another way is we don't want to forget them being metric spaces uh, subsets of a common metric space let's look for maps from x to y which are almost like isometries so we would uh, of course the uh, background picture one has is that if these two metric spaces were actually isometric then one would say that one would like the distance between them to be zero but instead if there is only a map which need not even be continuous such that distance between f of x f of y and distance between x and y these two are not equal but the difference between these two is bounded by epsilon for all x y and that's one thing the second thing is we one would like to say that i mean the map should be ideally where the map should be bijective but how the first one sort of captures injectivity at some scale but for the first part doesn't care take care of surjectivity so the second one says that it's almost surjective in the sense that if i look at the image of this x inside y every point in y is at most epsilon distant from some image point so the ball of radius epsilon around the set f of x there's no bracket here around the image f of x is essentially equal to well this is actually equal to i mean it's it's equal to this so this is almost surjectivity and uh, the first one is almost distance preserving let's say yeah okay that's a no epsilon isometry then you define the distance between two metric spaces to be the infimum of all such epsilons you can get infimum of epsilon such so that there is an epsilon isometry from x to y one can check that this is indeed this actually gives a distance in the set of all compact metric spaces as an example if you take the standard uh, the sphere of radius r centered at the origin so this is a subset of rn plus 1 uh, to be one space and uh, just a singleton zero to be the other space then it's easy to see that i mean if you look at the constant map from ascent to uh, the sphere to the origin that will have uh, that will be a r isometry and as r goes to zero you see that the gromov host of distance actually goes to zero as uh, the sphere shrinks so what this example shows is that this uh, even though the sphere is a nice manifold of dimension n while this is just i mean the origin is of course a manifold in a very trivial sense but the fact that the distance between the sphere gromov host of distance between the sphere and the origin can be very small shows that you really cannot say conclude much it's a very crude notion this notion of chroma host of distance in general you cannot conclude anything about the properties of the second manifold uh, even if the uh, it's close to a very nice manifold so <clears throat> now however colding proves uh, two extremely non trivial results in the if but notice one thing here the if i look at the sphere of radius r then the 
um, yeah, okay. So let me move on to this, what Colding's result says. So if, uh, Colding says that, um, <clears throat> given, so the point is that uh, we already know that, yeah, okay, so uh, the assumption, main assumption is somewhere tucked in the middle of this long statement. But given epsilon greater than zero and some dimension, there exists a delta, which depends only on that epsilon and dimension with the following property. So you start with any compact Riemannian manifold with the same assumption as in uh, Bishop's theorem that the Ricci curvature is greater than n minus one G. And now you assume, you already know that the volume of this will be less than volume of sphere by Bishop. But suppose you assume that the volume is very close to that of the sphere, volume of Sn minus delta. Then Kolding's theorem says that the gromov hausdorff distance between M and Sn is as small as we like. So by just by controlling volume, we can ensure that the gromov hausdorff distance can be very small. So, but the key assumption here is that the given manifold should satisfy this property. Otherwise it's definitely not true. I mean, for example, here's a, you take again, go back to the sphere example, So this is a sphere of radius R. Uh, well, radius one, let's say. Now I can uh, just draw a very long ellipsoid, very thin, long ellipsoid. It's so, uh, and I can uh, make it thin enough and long enough so that its volume is very close to that of the sphere. I mean, I can make the volume whatever I want actually, just by changing the shape of the ellipsoid. But obviously <clears throat> the, the gromov hausdorff distance between the sphere and the ellipsoid will not be small at all. Unfortunately, this, uh, some apps, uh, will uh, yeah ads keep on coming frequently yeah, okay. sorry about that I, it's hard to control i don't know which app is making it do that but hmm. it keeps happening so the point is that this ellipsoid that i've drawn even though its volume can be made very close to that of the sphere it won't have a ricci curvature bounded below i mean i necessarily have to make it sort of if i want to make it thin and long the Ricci curvature in some large parts will be almost close to zero. You can't have a uniform bound like this. So this condition is crucial. Under this condition, just by controlling volume, I can ensure that the gromov hausdorff distance is also very small. And in a separate paper, he proved the converse as well. Conversely, again, this assumption is always there. If the gromov hausdorff distance is small, then the, <clears throat> volume is almost uh, close to that of the sphere. Even this part is not obvious, actually. The gromov hausdorff smallness because what can happen is you can have the sphere. Again, let's imagine everything in Rn plus one. Your manifold can be very close to the sphere, close in the sense of just a host of close, but it can have lots of, uh, at a very small scale, it can be, it can wriggle a lot. Um, uh, 
this wriggling will add to the volume i mean it has to as when we talk about rectifiable sets and so on these are the things which can go wrong it can wriggle at small scales and keep adding to the volume so you can't uh, <coughs> ensure that um the volume will be close to that of the sphere actually yeah uh, anyway this is what the example i gave is not quite the right one i think because i want to contradict volume being greater than volume of sn minus epsilon not uh, this will this example will certainly have volume as large as we want but uh, that's not what i want to say i need a different example but you can think of some natural examples which will without this assumption my point is that without this assumption gromov host of closeness to the sphere will not give this property that the volume is greater than uh, all volume is almost that of the sphere again even in this case of course by bishop we have this it is this part the second inequality which is the non trivial part so what we uh, do is uh, we address these two questions in the kehler setting that uh, colding's result can be summarized just by saying that uh, sorry uh, yeah colding's results can be summarized just by saying that uh, if gromov host of close if and only if volume is close but the not for any arbitrary limit for the standard model spaces so here the corresponding result is given epsilon greater than 0 there exists delta such that if mng is a compact kähler manifold again the same hypothesis as in zang's theorem in the uh, the first assertion is that if the gromov host of distance between m and complex projective space is small then the volume is almost that of the so here again this is zang the first inequality the second one is what we proved the volume is almost that of the complex projective space and uh, the second one is if the volume is very close to that of the that of uh, cpn then the gromov host distance is small as well so these are the exact analogs of colding's the uh, theorem theorems but um, again this quite uh, it involves quite a bit of machinery to prove these results so i want uh, obviously i want we even able to start uh, except make a few general remarks and then i'll stop so let's for example for both of these in fact uh, one would need the remark but let me start with uh, just, sorry to interrupt but just uh, um, want to remind you about the time yeah that's why i said i'll stop after this remark so i'll just make one remark and stop is that okay yes yes yeah please yeah. go okay oh i couldn't hear you uh, fine let me just make one statement the for both of these uh, okay in particular let's say uh, yeah let me start with the first one if uh, the gromov's of distance is small then i would like to say volume is small a uh, volume is close now in typically what one does is assume that it's not true and then try to get a contradiction so you assume that there is no such delta so you'll get a sequence of delta n going to 0 and a sequence of manifolds uh no not delta n delta i and mi such that this will go to 0 the gromov host of distance between this mi and cpn will go to 0 and um one would like to get a contradiction out of all this well first of all the fact that the gromov host of distance between this and this is going to zero 
um yeah no uh, how does one use that the and here the starting point is a very basic it's an elementary theorem of gromov who stated it when he introduced this concept in the first place if you have any sequence of riemannian manifolds with ricci curvature bounded below by some fixed constant c in our case c is n minus 1 then one can always extract a subsequence which will converge to a compact metric space in the gromov hausdorff topology so then one would like the main point is to show that one would like to prove that this whatever uh, metric space you get is isometric to cpn this involves uh, quite a bit of uh, work and uh, this involves non trivial results of tian and others regarding kehler einstein manifolds and uh, and the starting <clears throat> okay so i'll just stop here so parmesh i am done so oh. um so, so first of all let us thank uh, harish for his wonderful talk Uh, although we are out of time we we'll, uh, we'll just take um, i mean we'll have one question if anybody has um so since nobody seems to be asking any question let me ask uh, just one question yeah uh, the title you had this fano manifold Ah. How to uh, capture that in terms of? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot. Actually, fa Fano manifolds are just Kähler manifolds. The differential geometric way of looking at Fano manifolds is just Kähler with Ricci greater than some constant times g. Okay, I see. so the canonical bundle being uh, uh, no the anti canonical bundle being ample uh -huh. will uh, give this by uh, this uh, yaus uh, kalabi yaus uh, this thing mm -hmm. i am more familiar with the algebraic geometric definition so i was wondering okay so that's that yeah. makes it the connection yeah. So I mean the correct geometric definition is that the anti-canonical bundle is ample, right? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. So okay. like the Grassmannian or something like that, I suppose. I don't know. Yes. Yes. Mm. Okay. So um, let us uh, thank um, Harish again for, for the wonderful talk. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I, before before closing the session, I would like to thank all the speakers. Uh, in this session mahender singh um, vimala ramani uh, ramesh kaselingam raisa disusa and harish sheshadri all the talks had been really wonderful i enjoyed them i only wish that there was more time and also opportunity for personal interaction unfortunately personal interaction is completely ruled out but maybe some other occasion thanks a lot yes yeah. bye thank you so thank you parmesh so on behalf of the organizing committee i just would like to give the final uh, remarks uh, part of ims 2020 professor parmeshwaran sankaran from institute of mathematical sciences cit campus chennai has organized the symposium on the topic topology and geometry professor mahender singh is the first speaker from iascr mohali enlightened the symposium on the topic doodles on surfaces and related groups in which the classical mixed and uh, virtual doodles were geometrically explained in detail followed by that professor vimala ramanmani from anna university chennai delivered an inspirational talk on the topic zero divisor cup length of real oriented grassmann manifolds in which various important results are highlighted in the algebraic point of view followed by that professor ramesh kaselingam from iit madras chennai presented various results on the topic smooth structures on cp power m for m between 4 to 8 and the adequate developments on the topic up to date have been delivered in a wonderful manner followed by that professor uh, raisa disosa from saint sons of college bangalore presented various important findings on the topic topology of real boat manifolds 
as a concluding talk of the symposium professor haris sesatri i am sorry if the institute is wrong uh, professor hari sesatri from indian institute of science bangalore addressed the gathering with the uh, inspiring lecture on the topic volume of fano manifolds by summarizing several important results from various decades on behalf of the organizing committee of ims 2020 i convey my sincere thanks and regards for organizing such a wonderful symposium with like excellent speakers and summarizing the adequate developments highlighting the recent results and pointed out the present challenges and future directions in the wings of topology and geometry to the best of my knowledge this important symposium will be very useful to all the young scholars as well as the established researchers in this domain thank you very much sir thank you very much sir okay bye bye sir shall we close sir bye sir thank you sir yeah. okay bye bye sir yeah thank thank you once again thank you madam thank you thank you sir yeah. sure sir shall we start ah yes sir so up sir uh, final uh, yes sir thank you lakshmanarayana sir the remarks to the uh, other participants so part yes, thank you for your present listening patient listening uh, and the other sessions will be followed as per the schedule and please join the particular sessions as per the links given in the uh, uh, schedule and also you have the paper presentation sessions in the afternoon for that also the links and the meeting id everything is given please go as per the schedule thank you very much